Hey everyone, welcome back. So uh, recently I was trying to buy a new coffee maker on Amazon. And so what a lot of people will do, and what I did, I went down to the ratings to see if the distribution of stars looked like this was a good or a bad product. And I noticed this little tiny note that I hadn't really noticed before. And it said something along the lines of, this is not just a simple average of the ratings, we do something a little bit more sophisticated behind the scenes. And that really got me thinking. There is this weird problem in ratings data where the ratings that are coming in for a particular product or a restaurant or whatever it is that you're rating might give you a very skewed view of the true ratings of that product for the general population. And you may already see that problem or you may not. We'll be going through it in this video. But this video is really born out of this problem that I found pretty interesting and hopefully you find interesting as well. So let's bring it back to the real world here. So let's say that you just designed a new lotion. So here's a brand spanking new lotion right here and you've got a cool tagline, maximize your likelihood of smooth skin. So you're really hyped about this lotion. You've done some focus groups. You think it's gonna be a pretty good product. And so you put it out there on your website and people can buy it off of the website. They also have the option to rate your new lotion. Let's just say there's three stars to keep things simple. So they can give it one star, two stars or three stars. And let's say that you have 10,000 ratings that have come in so far. So this n equals 10,000 isn't really going to be important in this video. The only reason I put that is to say that there's a big enough sample size so that we have confidence in the ratings that are coming in. So let's say that you look at the one, two, and three star ratings and you find this distribution to your dismay. You have 50% of the people said it's one star. Yikes. You have 10% of the people say it's two stars. And you have 40% of the people say it's three stars. And so the average rating comes out to 1.9 stars, which is much lower than you would have expected. And the other big bad thing is that there's a ton of people. So the biggest section of people are those that hated your product, that give you a one star. And so you're really thinking like, can this be real? Can this really be that bad of a product? I thought it was going to be really good. So before we start redesigning our product or thinking about ways to make it better, let's first think about if these ratings that we're seeing are really an accurate picture of the true ratings of our product. So let's follow this arrow up. What we think we're looking at currently is the probability that someone would rate it as one star, which we think is 50%, the probability someone would rate it as two stars, which we think is 10%, and the probability someone would rate it as three stars, which we think is 40%. But that's not the actual probabilities we're looking at. If you think about this whole system and ratings in general for restaurants on Yelp or products on Amazon or any rating you can think about, um, in order to get a big enough sample size, like 10,000, Typically, this rating has to be voluntary, which means that someone has to deliberately want to rate this product. And now let's step back for a second to think about what are the usual conditions under which you would rate a product? Usually it's because you either love the product and you want to express that love, or you hate the product and you want to express that hate. And that would kind of explain why these two bars, the one and three, are the biggest ones and stuff in the middle kind of doesn't get as much representation as it truly is because people who just kind of feel neutral or the product was eh, good enough for them, they're probably not going to go take the time to go review this thing on the website. And so we have this very classic problem called volunteer bias in ratings where because these ratings come from volunteers, not people who have to rate it, but because people are able to rate it if they want to, you're not going to get the true distribution. And so the natural question that comes up is that can we use the data that we do have and somehow unbias it to get a more accurate picture? And the answer is actually surprisingly yes. So let's continue on with the story. So as we said, these are not the probabilities that we're looking at here. The actual probabilities you're looking at here are somewhat related but fundamentally different. So you're looking at the probability that someone gives you a one star given that they choose to rate your product. So this is actually a conditional probability conditional on the event that someone decides to rate your product, which is a very big distinction to make. And the other two probabilities are very similar. And now in order to come back to this problem about can we use this data and somehow unbias it to get a better uh, description of the true ratings, let's fall back on our good friend Bayes' theorem. So for example, we know that probability of one star given rate can be written in terms of Bayes' theorem as these three probabilities. So probability of rate given one star, which is the reverse conditional the unconditional probability of one star, which is the actual thing we're after. So uh, let me just note that probability of one star is the unconditional probability that someone would give you a one star for this product. That's the actual number that we want to get here. And all that divided by the unconditional probability that someone would rate your product. So we have this equation here. We have this number on the left that comes from this biased rating data. 
The only question is, if we want this number here, we need to somehow get these two numbers in order to unbias the ratings. So first, let's look at this guy actually. What's the probability that someone would choose to rate your product? Since we're in an online setting, this is actually pretty easy to get. You just take the number of buyers who rate your product divided by the number of total buyers of your product. So for example, there's 10,000 people who bought your product and rated it, and then you would just divide that by the total number of people that bought your product, and you would get exactly this probability that someone would rate your product. Now the more tricky probability to get, and the one that is key and to the heart of this entire problem, is this guy. What's the probability that someone would rate your product given that they actually believe it deserves one star? So that's this guy right here. Let's pause and think about what that means. So there is some section of people out there in the world that think your product actually deserves one star. They actually just don't like it, and that's totally okay, that's just how they feel. Now the thing we're after is that for that section of people who truly hate your product, what is the probability that they would rate it, that they would feel the need to go rate this product on your website? And let's say that's equal to 40%. I'll come back to how do we get these numbers in just a moment, but let's just say that's 40%, pretty high. Now for people who truly believe that your product deserves two stars, what's the probability that they will rate it? Let's say that's 5%. So this is kind of in line with our understanding that people who love or hate your product are more likely to respond on a survey than people who feel very neutral about this product. And so let's say that the probability that someone rates your product, given that they truly believe it's great, three stars, is going to be 23%. So these two bars are clearly higher than this one, but the other thing to note is that the hate bar is the highest of them all, almost double as much as the love bar. So let's say that this is your data, and let's say you got these percentages from some kind of uh, research study that some researchers did in the past. So you're just going to assume that that distribution is the same for your product, which is, we'll come back to that assumption in just a moment, but let's roll with this for now. So now we have these numbers. We have probability of rate, and we have these biased ratings. So we can just do some simple algebra to get exactly these unbiased ratings that we're looking for. For example, let's do the first one. So probability of one star. All I did there is just rearrange the equation here. So if we rearrange the equation there, and we plug in these numbers, so let's go through plugging in each one so we can put the whole story together. What's the probability that someone gives you one star given that they rate it? That comes from the bias data, so that's 50%. So that's 50%. What's the unconditional probability someone rates your product? Let's say that's equal to 20%. So we'll just plug in 20% there. And what's the probability that someone rates your product given that it is actually one star for them? That comes from this table here, so that's 40%. So we plug 40% in there, we do the algebra, and we find that 25% is the actual percentage of people out in the world that think your product deserves one star. We do the same algebra for these two guys, and we get these two numbers, and now we have this new unbiased ratings data here. So let's pause and compare the biased rating data from the beginning of this video to the unbiased rating data that we have now. With the unbiased rating data, only 25% of people hate your product, versus before that was double. So this is clearly much different. We have that 40% of your people actually think that the product is kind of neutral, which is a severe jump from over here. And we have that 35% of the people love your product, which clearly is a little bit lower than here. But when you compare the hate and love buckets here, clearly this is much higher than this, much higher than it was over here. And another way to really understand how much we've mixed things up by unbiasing the data, look at the ranking over here. So if we rank these three categories, the highest one was one star, then three star, then two star. We've actually reversed those rankings. Now it's two star, followed by three star, followed by one star. So clearly this unbiasing has had a big effect on this distribution. If we take the average now, it's equal to 2.1 stars, which gets us past that two threshold. So the average doesn't move a lot but the distribution has changed a bunch. And so in a nutshell, hopefully you found this video interesting, which is that we can take biased data and we don't have to throw it away. We can actually just do some very clever transformations to it in order to unbias it. Now the last thing I'll say in this video and something that's surely on a lot of your minds is that how accurate is this here? Because the whole process relies on having good, accurate estimations for this probability of responding given that you think it's one star, or two star, or three stars. How do we actually get that? So what I said over here is we got it from some past research paper, but in order to get a better estimate, how would we actually judge that? 
it's not an easy question. For example, if you have enough money and resources, you could get a focus group of people, kind of forced participants in your study. Um, even then, it's not really forced because you have to opt into a focus group. So there's all sorts of biases going on. But if you assume for a moment the focus group is a truly random sample of people from the population, then you can ask how they truly feel about the product. And then you can ask them the question about how likely are you to uh, give a review on this product. And that can be the basis for these numbers here. Even then, you have to think about things like, is the likelihood that the person tells you the true likelihood? Because people's behaviors don't always match up to what they say in the moment. So all that is just to say that there's a lot of factors going on here. But if I had to say there's one place to spend your money and your resources on, if you want a truly unbiased rating data in the future, is to truly understand this distribution as good as you possibly can for your product or your kind of area of expertise. So um, hopefully you thought this video is pretty interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I'll catch you next time.